Our story begins with Heihachi Mishima, a man whose habits include war profiteering, teaching karate to grizzly bears, and executing his family members in increasingly overdramatic ways. Heihachi values strength above all else, and he doesn't think his five-year-old son Kazuya has what it takes to be his successor, so he decides to toughen him up a bit by throwing him off a cliff. As you can imagine, Kazuya is pretty peeved about this. In fact, he's so peeved that it activates his devil gene. This has been the source of numerous retcons, so I'll explain it in more detail later. But for right now, all you need to know is that the Devil Gene gives Kazuya superpowers and also makes him a big jerk. It's like the symbiote, but grape-flavored. Fast forward 21 years and Heihachi is bored, so he hosts the first King of Iron Fist tournament, where the world's greatest martial artists compete to win a trophy in the shape of his head. Oh, and also a lot of money. Kazuya doesn't care about the prize, but he sees this as the perfect opportunity to get some vengeance. So he punches his way through a bunch of weirdos, defeats his father, and throws his unconscious body off that same cliff. He celebrates by contorting his face into something that roughly approximates a human smile, and Tekken 1 comes to a close. Pretty straightforward, right? Don't get used to it. With Heihachi presumed dead, Kazuya takes over his company, the Mishima Zaibatsu, and doubles down on the whole supervillain thing. As well as continuing all of his dad's nefarious schemes, he hatches a few of his own, such as trying to take over Japan with an army of genetically modified kangaroo super soldiers. Yes, really. He also hosts the King of Iron Fist Tournament 2 Electric Boogaloo, just to prove that no one is strong enough to stop him. But as it turns out, Heihachi survived the fall, for he possesses something even more powerful than the Devil Gene, Plot Armor. He enters the tournament to get some vengeance for Kazuya's vengeance. But the Mishimas aren't the only important players this time around, because all that kangaroo stuff catches the attention of a wildlife conservationist named Jun Kazama. She heads to the tournament in hopes of stopping Kazuya's unethical experiments, but when she meets him, he's all, Hey girl, did you just deplete my health bar? Because you're a real knockout. And she falls head over heels. Jun is such a good Buddhist girl that just being near her seems to suppress Kazuya's evil tendencies, but not enough to keep him from going devil mode when he sees his dad is alive. They have the rematch, and Heihachi just barely comes out on top. Having learned that throwing people off cliffs isn't as deadly as you would think, he kicks things up a notch by getting lava involved. And with that, Tekken 2 comes to a close. With Kazuya presumed dead, Heihachi reclaims the Zaibatsu and uses its resources to create a private paramilitary organization called Tekken Force, which I regret to inform you is not made up of mutant marsupials. He dispatches Tekken Force all over the world to keep tabs on his enemies and search for valuable artifacts. Fast forward 15 years, and Tekken Force is poking around an old Aztec temple when they wake up the not-so-jolly green giant. This is Ogre, an alien superweapon who was sent to Earth thousands of years ago for some unknown purpose and was revered as a god of war. He massacres the Tekken Force soldiers and then goes on the hunt for powerful fighters whose abilities he can absorb, which is a convenient way of writing off a bunch of characters from the first two games. Heihachi, rather than being horrified by all of this, just goes, Wow, an alien superweapon, and starts researching how he can use it for his own personal gain. Meanwhile, June is living an idyllic life out in the woods with her son Jin, who looks a lot like Kazuya, I wonder what that's all about. One day, June receives a premonition that she's gonna get got by Ogre, so she tells Jin that if anything happens to her, he should seek out his grandfather, Heihachi. People often question why she would send her son to live with the worst guy ever, but this is the same woman who fell in love with a devil, so I think she's just a bad judge of character. That night, Ogre shows up and Jin tries to fight him, but immediately gets knocked out. He wakes up to find Jun gone and his house destroyed, but he does have a cool new arm tattoo, so silver lining, I guess. Heihachi wants nothing to do with Jin until he mentions Ogre, at which point he becomes all too eager to take him under his wing. After four years of training, Jin is ready to face Ogre, so Heihachi announces the King of Iron Fist Tournament 3 to lure him out of hiding. And sure enough, Ogre is unable to resist the buffet of powerful fighters. Unfortunately for Heihachi, he apparently trained Jin a little too well, because instead of just incapacitating Ogre, he straight up kills him. Realizing that Jin poses a major threat, Heihachi orders Tekken Force to turn him into Swiss cheese. As you can imagine, Jin is pretty peeved about this. In fact, he's so peeved that it activates his Devil Gene. He proceeds to, what's the technical term? Oh yeah, beat the absolute crap out of Heihachi. Tekken 3 concludes with him flying off into the night like the emo album cover he was always meant to be. The Zaibatsu scientists collect DNA from Ogre's remains and attempt to splice it with Heihachi's own DNA to create Ogre-powered super soldiers. This sounds like a recipe for disaster, which it is, but not the rampaging monster on the loose kind of disaster, just the massive waste of resources kind of disaster. They think the reason the experiment failed is because Heihachi doesn't have the Devil Gene. What does the Devil Gene have to do with Ogre's DNA, you ask? Good question. So Heihachi goes looking for Kazuya's crispy corpse, which he learns was collected by a biotech company called G-Corp. On Christmas night, Heihachi sends Tekken Force to raid G-Corp's facilities, but one by one, a mysterious assailant decks their halls. It turns out to be none other than Kazuya, who was revived by G-Corp scientists and is now seeking vengeance for Heihachi's vengeance for his initial vengeance. 
since taking Kazuya by force isn't going to work. Eihachi instead invites him to, you guessed it, the King of Iron Fist Tournament 4. Jin, who spent the past couple years vacationing in Australia to recover from that time he got riddled with bullets and turned into a devil, also decides to join in on the family reunion. He only gets to punch a few weirdos before he's kidnapped by Tekken Force, and Kazuya makes it to the final round but loses to Heihachi once again. They're both brought to Hanmaru, the Mishima family's temple, but for some reason only Jin gets put in restraints. As soon as Kazuya sees him, he goes devil mode and knocks Heihachi out with his mind. Aw, that's so sweet, he's gonna rescue his son, because deep down he's still- Oh, never mind, he wants to steal his life force. So, now is probably a good time to explain what the devil's going on with the devil. The devil gene itself doesn't technically give you any powers. It just lets you bond with an incorporeal entity called a devil. And it's this entity that gives you the powers and the bad life advice. Even though multiple people have the devil gene, there's only one devil. So usually, only one person has devil powers at any given time. But when Kazuya quote-unquote died, devil split in two. Half remained with him, and the other half sought out Jin, giving him his arm tattoo. As a result, neither Jin nor Kazuya is as powerful as Kazuya used to be, but if one of them kills the other, both halves of Devil will be reunited and return its host to full strength. Got it? Too bad, we're moving on. Jin breaks free of his restraints and defeats Kazuya, then Heihachi wakes back up and immediately regrets it. Jin is tempted to kill them, but he sees a statue of Buddha and feels real guilty about it, so he flies away. Tekken 4 ends on a shot of a single white feather, because Jin can be your angle or your devil. Just when Heihachi and Kazuya think their day can't get any worse, Hanmaru is suddenly bombarded by a bunch of robots called Jax. They briefly work together to fight off the Mohawked machines, but as soon as Kazuya spots an exit, he goes, See ya, chump, and leaves his dad to get blown up. Nani? Later that year, an anonymous figure takes control of the Zaibatsu. And I know what you're thinking, no, it's not secretly Heihachi. Whoever it is, he announces the King of Iron Fist Tournament 5, and Jin enters because he thinks it will help him learn to control his Devil Gene. You see, Devil's not too happy that Jin keeps ignoring its bad life advice, so every now and then it's been hijacking his body and wreaking havoc, which is a tad inconvenient. Jin punches his way through a bunch of weirdos, and when he gets to the final round, his opponent is a dude who looks like Heihachi crossed with a beholder. This is Jinpachi Mishima, Heihachi's father and the source of the Devil Gene. Is what I would say if Tekken made any sense, but we all know that's not the case. Jinpachi is actually possessed by a totally unrelated evil purple monster that doesn't have a name and literally never comes up again. As far as Mishimas go, Jinpachi isn't that bad of a guy. He founded the Zaibatsu during World War II to capitalize on the need for military equipment, so uh, not a great start. But afterwards, he had a crisis of conscience and ceased all weapons manufacturing. Heihachi thought this was lame and stupid and dumb, so he staged a coup to take over the company. If that wasn't bad enough, he also imprisoned Jinpachi under Hanmaru, where the not-devil began to corrupt his mind. When Hanmaru blew up, Jinpachi was freed. Worried about the destruction he might cause, he used the last of his willpower to summon the world's strongest fighters in hopes that one of them could kill him. By the time Jin gets there, the Not Devil has taken over completely, but he manages to defeat it and grant his great grandfather eternal rest. This leaves the Zaibatsu without a leader, so Jin dons an edgy new outfit and ascends to the throne. While all this is going on, Kazuya learns that the Jacks were sent by G Corp's higher ups, who betrayed him for reasons. This is the worst and last mistake of their lives, and before long, Kazuya is in charge of G Corp. So by the end of Tekken 5, the two most powerful companies in the world are being run by a couple of devils who really hate each other. What could possibly go wrong? Seemingly out of nowhere, Jin orders Tekken Force to attack everything and everyone it can, including innocent civilians. His sudden heel turn gives Kazuya the opportunity to sway public opinion in G-Corp's favor by fighting back against the evil Zaibatsu. But neither Jin nor Kazuya is the protagonist this time around. That honor belongs to the new character Lars Alexanderson, a former Tekken Force officer who's leading a rebellion against Jin. He claims it's because of all the war crimes, but I think he's just sick of the Tekken Force helmet messing up his Yu-Gi-Oh hair. The story opens with him leading a raid on his Aibatsu lab. Things are going well until G Corp shows up to raid the exact same lab at the exact same moment. Well, this is... awkward. The Jacks kill everyone but Lars, who's saved by a girl with chainsaws for arms. This is Elisa Boskanovich, a robot created by the Zaibatsu's top scientist in the image of his dead daughter. She was told to stay in the lab, but the lab is kind of explody at the moment, so she decides to tag along with Lars. They go looking for a MacGuffin at Mishima Estate, where they learn that Heihachi, who I remind you is canonically a normal human man with no superpowers, somehow survived getting blown up and buried under an entire building's worth of rubble. They also learn that Lars is his illegitimate son whom he abandoned in Sweden. As you can imagine, Lars is pretty peeved about this. In fact, he's so peeved that he shoots Heihachi in the face. What, did you think he had the devil gene too? 
Heihachi is fine, because even his teeth have plot armor, and Lars and Elisa get the heck out of Dodge. Having accomplished, let me check my notes, nothing, they go meet up with genius billionaire playboy philanthropist Lee Chao Lan. Lee was actually introduced all the way back in Tekken 1, but this is the first time he's plot relevant, because he has some intel on Jin's location. Using this, Lars is finally able to confront his nephew. But plot twist, it turns out the robot created by the Zaibatsu and found in the Zaibatsu lab actually works for the Zaibatsu. Who could have seen that coming? She goes all Terminator on Lars just long enough for Jin to escape, and then she flies off after him. Lars follows them to Egypt, and thanks to the help of a goth fortune teller, he's able to beat them to their destination, which is a mysterious temple that suddenly appeared in the desert. Lars heads inside and meets a big crystal chicken called Azazel. He says, Fear me, for I am the rectifier of all things. Mankind bound me, thinking they could escape subjugation. Willfully and selfishly, they have reduced the world to tatters. Now the sinners must atone. So Lars beats him up, and then he goes outside and beats Elisa up, and then Jin, sensing a pattern, finally explains what the heck is going on. Apparently, when he took control of the Zaibatsu, he started hearing Azazel's voice in his head. Azazel's origins are unknown, but he's really, really old, and he's the one who first gave the Devil Gene to humanity via the slimy orb in his chest. He was eventually overthrown and sealed within his own temple, but for vague magic prophecy reasons, his spirit was reawakened when Jin and Kazuya fought at the end of Tekken 4. With every passing day, his spirit grew in power. Jin wanted to destroy him before it was too late, but for even vaguer magic prophecy reasons, Azazel's body could only be freed by plunging the world into chaos and despair. So in summary, Jin started World War III on purpose to wake up a big crystal chicken so that he could punch the big crystal chicken and stop it from wiping out humanity. Man, remember when these games were about a fighting tournament? Anyway, Lars is like, well, I already took care of Azazel, so I guess we can all go home now. Wait, why do I hear boss music? Only a Devil Gene user can kill Azazel, so all Lars did was make him angry, and yellow for some reason. Some anime nonsense happens and Azazel explodes, seemingly taking Jin down with him. Lars brings Elisa's body to Lee for repairs. It must conclude Tekken 6. Does anyone else have a headache? Tekken 7 is slightly less crazy, keyword being slightly. With Jin presumed dead, Heihachi reclaims the Zaibatsu and continues the war against G-Corp. His plan is to get Kazuya cancelled by revealing to the world that he's a devil, which I'm gonna be honest, I didn't know was supposed to be a secret. One day, while he's chilling in his dojo, he gets attacked by Akuma from Street Fighter. How did a character from a totally different game end up in the Tekken universe, you ask? Good question. So Akuma wants to kill the Mishimas to fulfill a promise he made to Heihachi's dead wife Kazumi 20 years ago. When Heihachi asks what took him so long, he says he was waiting for them to be at their strongest so they would be worthy opponents. Akuma knocks Heihachi out and assumes he's dead for some reason, so he pieces out to go find Kazuya. Heihachi realizes a fight between the two of them would be the perfect opportunity to catch Kazuya purple-handed, so he sets up a satellite to spy on G-Corp's headquarters and waits for Akuma to arrive. Meanwhile, out in the middle of the desert, the United Nations finds a surprisingly not-dead Jin and tries to apprehend him, which goes about as well as you would expect. He wanders to a nearby marketplace and collapses from exhaustion, but before the UN can recapture him, Lars shows up to save the day, and by save the day, I mean gun down a bunch of UN peacekeepers to rescue a war criminal. He heads back to Lee's place to reunite with Elisa, who's fully repaired and probably not evil anymore. It's at this point the writers realize there's nothing for Jin to do until Tekken 8, so he falls into a coma for the rest of the game. Akuma then attacks Kazuya, causing him to go devil mode, and Heihachi catches it all on camera. After making his call-out post, he shoots Kazuya with a space laser, and Kazuya shoots the space laser with a face laser, and the satellite falls out of orbit, destroying a few city blocks. People are a lot more upset about that than about Kazuya being a devil, so Heihachi's plan totally backfired. Left with no other options, he decides to end things once and for all by challenging Kazuya to a duel inside an active volcano. But first, he gives an interview to tell the world his side of the story. As it turns out, his wife Kazumi was a Devil Gene user, and a member of the Hachijo clan of assassins. After Heihachi took control of the Zaibatsu, the Hachijo deemed him a threat to the world and ordered Kazumi to kill him. She attempted to do so, but even back then, Heihachi's plot armor was too strong, and he defeated her at a breakneck pace. It was on this very day that he threw five-year-old Kazuya off the cliff, not to toughen him up, but to learn if he possessed the same evil power as his mother. At least, that's what he claims. There's a theory that Heihachi is lying about all of this to make himself look good, which I hope is the case, because otherwise, it fills the plot with more holes than Jin had at the end of Tekken 3. Either way, Heihachi and Kazuya have their climactic showdown, and in the end, Kazuya finally gets vengeance for Heihachi's vengeance for his initial vengeance. The game tries really hard to convince us that Heihachi is gone for good this time, but I'll believe it when I see it. The final scene shows Jin waking up from his nap, seemingly now in full control of the Devil Gene, and vowing to end the war he started. So that is everything you need to know going into Tekken 8. 
Well, except for almost a hundred side characters whose stories are mostly unrelated to the main plot. Eh, I'm sure you'll figure it out. Good morrow everyone, Silvershire here, and welcome back to Palace Swamp, where I rank the costumes and character designs of your favorite fighting games. And by your favorite fighting games, I mean my favorite fighting games, and by my favorite fighting games, I mean Tekken. Has filed for bankruptcy.